Scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, hello again. <laughs> uh, because today is Easter Sunday, I, po I postpone the start of uh, the new sermon series in 2 Corinthians in order for us to uh, get us thinking more specifically about the resurrection life that we're called to live as God's people who have been raised with Christ. <clears throat> uh, when the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, he's saying that his old self actually died. Do you believe that about yourself? Your old self died. But the good news is that you've been raised anew in Christ by the power of his resurrection. That he's now he's a new creation, and so are we if we're in Christ. And we live now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? The one way to think of the resurrection life is to think of it as a spirit Failed life. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that it's important for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You think about that. Okay. So before I, I get into the meat of the message, I, I wanted to first offer you two reasons why it's vitally important for us to live a spirit-filled life. And if you never thought about it, I hope this is really informative and helpful, okay? Number one, in our passage today, the Apostle Paul says this in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, right? He urges us to make the best use of the time. Do you know Why? What's his reason? He says, because the days we're living in are evil. In other words, people are choosing to live foolishly and in opposition to the will of God. And so in his mind, the, the logic is this. The antidote to this foolishness, this foolish living, is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like if you don't want to live foolishly, if you want to live wisely, guess what? He's saying you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we may say that the filling of the Holy Spirit is the key to discerning what is good and evil about the present day we're living in. Second, notice that this is the part in Ephesians where Paul describes what our basic horizontal relationships are supposed to look like, right? Immediately following, it says, wives, submit to your husbands, right? Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Parents, especially fathers, don't exasperate your kids, right? And instruct them in the Lord. And there's even mention of slaves and master relations here, right? And the modern day equivalent would be something like, of an employer-employee relationship. <laughs> and so we, we may also say this. The filling of the Holy Spirit is the key to maintaining God-honoring relationships at all of these different levels. Do Christians struggle in their marriages? Of course they do. Do, do Christians struggle with generational problems, these parent-child relations? Of course they do. Do we stress over work and do we have a hard time sometimes with our bosses and those above us? Of course we do. Right? The Bible doesn't say that if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, all of these problems will magically go away. But it does say that the work of the Holy Spirit is necessary for you to live out these relationships in a God-honoring way. That's why to be filled with the Spirit is so important. 
So I outlined the message in three parts today. So I'll be working through this outline. Number one, what it means to be filled. Okay, what does it mean? Let's think about that for a moment. And then part two, what are the effects of being filled? And part three, how are we to be filled? So number one, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Let me ask you another question. What comes to mind, brothers and sisters, when you hear the expression, filled with the Spirit of God? What comes to mind? I know many of you have grown up in like a, a charismatic church or a charismatic ministry, youth, whatever. What comes to mind? Be honest. You don't have to say it out loud, but just think about it for a moment. Let me offer you a multiple choice question, okay? Choose the best answer in your mind, quietly. Number one, well, for, first of all, the question, what happens? What happens when you're filled with the Spirit? Number one, you start speaking in tongues. Number two, you experience some kind of physical healing. Number three, you start seeing visions and all of a sudden you bust out in prophetic, prophetic utterances. Or number four, for those of you who are good at taking exams, you know, like, the way I take it, I usually, you know, I, I, if I have to guess, I choose number four, okay? So here it is. <laughs> number four, praise and thanksgiving flow from your heart, and you start submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Some of you may have this idea that to be filled with the Spirit you need to be in a room filled with other people speaking or shouting in different tongues and being maybe prophesied over. Is that your vision of being filled? Some of you may have a different picture. Maybe you didn't grow up in a charismatic church, okay? And, and you have maybe this in your mind. Right? This is where I, I show off our new projector. Whoa, we can actually see. Wow, what a resurrection miracle, right? <laughs> Some of you may have this image of a battery getting recharged and you feel like, oh my goodness, this morning I'm only at 70%, you know? Or how about this image, next image? Maybe you have this image. Maybe this is how you feel like this morning, okay? You have the image of your gas tank basically at empty. You know, the, the battery or the gas tank image may be helpful to some degree. I'm not saying it's totally unhelpful, Sometimes I think like this too. But these ways of thinking, they're extremely impersonal, right? It's an impersonal way of thinking about being filled with the Spirit of God, right? As if God's Spirit is some kind of liquid or gas substance. Let me tell you this. It, it would be much, much better if you thought of the Holy Spirit as a person because that's exactly who he is. He is a personal being. He's a personal God. If you consider how our spouses or close friends tend to fill our own lives, you'll begin to appreciate, I believe, the Holy Spirit's work even more. So let me give you an example of uh, something that I experienced in my own life, okay? When I first met Joyce, sorry, Abel, uh, she, she didn't know how to cook. No. <laughs> Let, let me finish, let me finish. It, it ends up well, okay? She didn't, I didn't finish my sentence. <laughs> she didn't know how to cook meat very well, okay? Especially steak, okay? She enjoyed her steak well done. That was almost a deal breaker for me, right? But her other godlier traits won me over, and so we eventually got married. And over time, we began to actually influence one another. And so after about three years or so, she was finally able to appreciate the taste of a nicely seared, medium rare, <laughs> medium, that's how, how you must eat your steak, okay? Medium rare ribeye cut, all right? In fact, I won't mention who, but someone graciously, one family graciously dropped off about nine cuts of good quality steak this past week at the Bang House. And so I cooked all of them up for the family, and guess who ate the most of it? Uh, Joyce was the one who ate most of those nine cuts, right? She loved it. And that's an example 
of Joyce being filled with the fullness of her husband's love for steak. <laughs> That's how it works, honestly. If, that, if you're filled with someone, you will begin to love what they love. Right? You will begin to even learn to appreciate the food they eat. So when the Bible says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, you should be thinking in very personal terms. Like God is actually entering into your personal space, your personal life, and he's going to influence you so that you can think and act in a way that honors him. Like he will be the center of your life now. So nothing you do is, is sort of divorced from him. Everything you do is so in some way connected to him. It's not a coincidence that the Apostle Paul draws a connection here between getting drunk with wine and being filled with the Holy Spirit. You think about this. What, what does DUI stand for, right? You all know this, right? I hope you're never guilty of this, but you know, driving under the influence of what? Of alcohol, DUI. And so Paul is saying, do not place yourself under the influence of alcohol because that's going to inevitably lead to debauchery, right? loose, immoral living. You're going to lose control of yourself at some point and do foolish things. Rather than that, he's saying place yourself under the influence of the Holy Spirit, who is a, a person who wants to change you for the better, you see. That's the vision you should have for your life. I once heard an older pastor give this uh, really good preaching advice to, a, to younger pastors. He says, when you preach, imagine that Jesus is sitting in the front row, right? And think about how that would change the way you preach. I confess that's how I often think when I'm preaching up here. And that helps me handle the word of God with greater reverence. I notice that whenever our other staff members stand up here to preach, and I'm sitting right there, they never look at me. Right? They're always avoiding eye contact. They go like this. They go like, right? I'm like, I'm here, right? I'm trying to make eye contact. They never look at me. Very rarely, maybe once, you know, over the past 14 years, they've looked at me, right? <clears throat> Why? It's because my presence, in some way, influences them. I'm sure I make them nervous sometimes, but I hope that my presence at least forces them to be more careful in the way they handle Scripture. And if that's the case with me, you know, sitting there, how much more would it be true if we all imagine that Jesus is sitting in the front row and not me, you know? That's the idea. And I think we'd all be wise to apply that same principle in other context and situations of our lives. And so when you speak to your husband, when you speak to your wife, for instance, what if you imagine that Jesus was standing right next to you? How would that change your speech and your tone? And when you meet up with your friends, perhaps, and you're, you're tempted to gossip about this person or that person, what if you imagine that Jesus was right there, sitting right next to you? And maybe when you're by yourself, Maybe at night, right, on your phone or in front of your computer, tempted to look at something inappropriate. What if you imagined that Jesus was right next to you? How would that change your thought? How would that influence your behavior? I think it would. That's what it means to be filled with another person. It means to be influenced. Number two, what are the effects of being filled? This passage actually lists some of the direct effects of being filled with the Spirit. Notice that it doesn't mention anything about speaking in tongues or prophesying over people. And granted, this is not meant to be like an exhaustive list, but notice what Paul does mention. Notice what he does emphasize. Three things. Singing songs of praise. Giving thanks to the Lord always. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He mentioned, he could have mentioned you know, probably many more things, but these are the three things he emphasizes. So I want to unpack each of them one by one. I'll do it briefly, okay? Number one, we're to sing songs of praise. This is what is expected of people who are filled with the Spirit. 
You know, even during times of great persecution, did you know that Christians were known for being a people who would respond to their difficult, impossible circumstances in songs of praise? This is our legacy as Christian people. There's an ancient letter written by a Roman governor named Pliny during the early second century, and he didn't know what he should do with these strange people who call themselves Christians during this time. You know, when they were being persecuted, uh, they, would, they would have this really strange behavior in his mind. And so he wrote to Trajan, who was an emperor at the time, seeking his counsel. And in one part of his letter, this is what he wrote. These people, these people, they gather together and they sing hymns to Christ as a God. It's just so weird. And so as early as the second century, Christians were known for their singing praises to their God. It was so strange for these Roman leaders to observe. One thing we're also reminded of, of today is that there's this vertical dimension as well as a horizontal dimension in the way we, we sing. Uh, first, the vertical dimension we can observe where in verse 19 it says, we're to sing and make melody to the Lord directly with our hearts. Right? We sing to the Lord, right? There is none like you, O oh God, right? No one else can touch my heart like you do. We sing to the Lord directly. But then there's also this horizontal dimension to praise as well, addressing one another in psalms and hymns. And we address each other. And perhaps this can be manifested in, in the way we sing about God to one another. Not, not directly to God, but we sing Songs like, how great is our God, right, brothers, sisters? We sing about our God together, how great is our God. All will see how great is our God. It's less direct, it's more sort of horizontal, singing about God, encouraging each other in song, through song. From the world's perspective, this is very odd. It doesn't make much sense to them at all because they don't view God the same way we do. They, they view Taylor Swift like, as this God, because that's, they go all crazy. They go all crazy at her conference or her concerts, right? Practically worship her, but they feel like, they, they look at what we're doing here. Why, why do these people gather to worship this God? It's so strange to them. But this is what people who are filled with the Spirit do. They recognize God as who he is, almighty, worthy, God of all gods, so we worship him. Secondly, it says that we're to give thanks to the Lord always. Verse 20, giving thanks to God always for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this also is very strange if you think about it. I mean, always, really? How can we always thank God? Always, right? This only makes sense to those who are filled with the Spirit. I remember complaining to my mom once, and uh, you know, some of you may know this, I have my weekly routine with my mom. I, every Monday, virtually every Monday, we spend time together by going to Costco. So that's our routine. We go Costco shopping, that's my time with her, uh, and uh, sometimes we have lunch together. But you know, one time I remember, uh, I was complaining to, to her about my life circumstances, about other people in ministry, uh, and so I wasn't very happy that morning. And after listening to me for about a minute or two, you know, she, she changed her tone, and she said, and she, you know, she speaks to me in Korean, uh, but she usually refers to me in my Korean name, right, chi But this time she goes, Oksanim, right, we passed her, right, Oksanim, right? And uh, I'll, I'll uh, translate what she said. She said, if you think about it, there's no reason for us to complain about anything, because every moment we're given is an opportunity to give thanks to God, right? <laughs> Words of wisdom. How could she do that? <laughs> and, and trust me, she's not always like that either, okay? Uh, she's also a fallen sinner like all of us, but, but that morning she was different. You know why? Because that morning she was filled with the Spirit. Because that morning she read her Bible, she reflected on scripture, she prayed, and she was filled with the Spirit. And that morning, I woke up, and I neglected the word. Okay, I, ne I neglected prayer. So I woke up disgruntled, 
and complaining, having this, you know, grumbling spirit, and that kind of spilled over. That's the difference. I wasn't filled. She was. I wasn't influenced by God's word. She was. And when I think about people who have suffered a lot in this life, I, one person that comes to mind is a sister named Johnny Erickson Tata. She's an older, older figure. Uh, she's still alive, by the way. But uh, she, was an, an, she was an inspiration for so many people in my generation. And I first heard her story when I was a college student, and she helped me better understand how it's possible to suffer well in the Lord. A few details about her life, okay? In 1967, she dove into the Chesapeake Bay after misjudging the shallowness of the water, and her, her spine basically got crushed, and she became a quadriplegic, and she was paralyzed from the shoulders down. And during her two years of receiving treatment, according to her autobiography, she experienced anger and depression and suicidal thoughts and doubts about her faith, as she confesses in her, in her book. But she also says, soon after, and I'm not sure how soon it was, but eventually, God began to grab hold of her heart and reminded her that his ways are higher than hers. And so over time, I'm not saying this happened immediately, but over time, she learned how to paint with a brush between her teeth because she loved art, okay? And she began to sell her artwork, and she was able to express herself through her writings, writing about her struggles and the lessons that God has been teaching her through all the different trials she's been facing. She became a different woman, a godly one, one who was filled with the Spirit. And here's, here's some of the things she's written in the past. My wheelchair was a key to seeing all this happen, especially since God's power always shows up best in weakness. So here I sit, glad that I have not been healed on the outside, but glad that I've been healed on the inside, healed from my own self-centered wants and wishes. And she also wrote, he has chosen not to heal me, but to hold me. The more intense the pain, the closer his embrace. Right, what a different perspective. And lastly, the paralysis, she once wrote, is my greatest mercy. How can you think like this? You can't. You can't respond to suffering in this way unless you are filled with the Spirit, seeing that God is with you and is for you, by your side, in your suffering. Thirdly, we're called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right? No one... I know, loves to submit to any authority in this life. I don't like to do it either. Okay? You think I like submitting myself to my elders in these meetings? Okay, I want to get things moving. I want to I go, go as fast as I can right, to the destination that I have in my mind. But no, it's, like, it's a slow process sometimes, oftentimes. So I've got to submit. Oh, you think differently? Okay. I'll wait another year or two, maybe three. Okay? It's often frustrating. No one likes to submit to a different person, right? But if you're filled with the Spirit of God, it says you will have this desire and willingness to submit to one another, even if, here's the key, even if they may not deserve your respect. <laughs> you know, some of you may have a, be having a hard time in marriage. Maybe you're just having a hard time respecting your husband, or maybe your wife is just not lovable right now, right? Maybe you have a very difficult employer, like your boss is just impossible, and you have a hard time submitting in those contexts. Would you disagree with that? It, it's not hard usually. It's, it's, it's not as hard, let me say. It's not as hard to submit to people that you idolize and completely adore, right? But it's humanly impossible to submit to people and serve those whom you really don't like at all and you vehemently disagree with. So you have to keep this in mind. This is very, really important, okay? Those who are filled with the Spirit, they're to submit to others out of reverence, not for the person, 
that they're submitting to, but out of reverence for Christ. That's the key. You're to do so out of reverence for Christ. That means we don't submit to others because they're worthy of our submission or our service. No, we do so because Christ is worthy, right? Because he is our Lord, because we live in obedience to him. He's the one who gave his life for us. Unworthy sinners, people who were once his enemies, and yet he loved us, right? He gave his life for us. He served us. And the, the point is this. If he did that for us, how can we refuse to submit to others if that's what our Lord calls us to do? And so if you're filled with the Spirit, you will, even though it's hard, you will submit to others out of reverence for him. Amen? The last part, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna just mention two things here, okay? Uh, many more things I could say, but I'll just uh, wrap it up in just two ways that we're, we're to strive to be filled with the Spirit. Number one, brothers and sisters, let's acknowledge our daily need for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have to actually recognize that we have a need. Right? Isn't it interesting that none of us virtually, I'd be surprised if there's one, none of us can live without our smartphones. We all become so addicted. I'm ashamed to say it, but I confess I'm pretty much addicted to my phone as well. Right? I'm gonna need to do something about that at some point in my life, right? but that's not what I wanna talk about today. <laughs> what I wanted you to think about here is what, what makes this smartphone work, right, this amazing machine? It's not just the hardware, okay? What's actually more important, I'm sure most of you would agree, what's more important is the software, right, the applications, the apps make this machine work so beautifully. I was, uh, I remembered a conversation that was um, made between our brother Phil on. Phil, are you here somewhere? Okay, he's in the back there. Uh, he used to work at the Apple store, so he knows iPhones really well. And uh, If you want an Apple product, just go talk to him. But he was, you know, <laughs> Pastor Xiong, he just transitioned from Android to iPhone, okay? And he was, he was kind of complaining about, you know, how it was different, how it felt different, it's kind of weird, you know, things don't work the way that his Android phone used to work. And Phil was like, what are we talking about? Right? Phil was like, the iPhone's so much better. And he kept on saying, right, it's the apps, right, the apps, the quality apps, right, quality apps, right? <laughs> he was trying to sell this phone, right, to Patrick Shion. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was quite, it was quite humorous, actually, but I, I didn't, I have an iPhone too, and uh, there's some things I like about my Android, my past Android, but I, I do recognize that some things are, are with, better, with the, better with the iPhone. But it's like the apps are that important. You know, if, if, I, if I wanted to burn some time, you know, what I, you'll probably find me on my phone, clicking onto chess.com, right? And it's amazing. I can play with anyone in the world who is on that app at the same time, right? Like the, the uh, algorithm just some, and then it matches me with someone at my level, and I, I, I play with a guy like in, I don't know, China sometimes, or, or you know, whatever, Europe. It's amazing. But, the, but that's the beauty. That's the power of the app. And the reason why I share this is because there's a spiritual analogy here, right? The spiritual analogy is that the person who functions as a spiritual app in our lives is guess who? It's the Holy Spirit. Because for our lives to actually work according to God's will, we need the Holy Spirit to actively apply the work of God's redeeming grace in each of our lives. We need his, his power. We need his ability to apply God's grace in each of us. In seminary, we used to use the categories of redemption accomplished versus redemption applied, okay? 
And we, we made it very clear that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he was the one who accomplished the salvation that we needed once and for all through his death and resurrection, which we celebrate today. But guess who applies this redemptive work? It's the Holy Spirit who applies what Christ has accomplished. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need him. We're to yearn for his work in our lives. Lastly, how are we to be filled? We're to be filled by letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Where do I get, where do I get this idea? Well, there's a parallel connection <clears throat> between Colossians chapter 3, a different passage that we did not read today, and Ephesians 5, which we did read today. Right? The two passages are actually almost identical if you look at them side by side. Right? Even the words that follow these sections, they speak of marital relations, you know, husband and wife relations, and also parent-child relations. It's almost like it says this, the Apostle Paul sort of cut and paste in his thoughts. Right? And so you have Colossians 3. I'll read uh, two verses, and then you'll kind of hear, oh my goodness, this echoes Ephesians 5, our passage today. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And the only thing that's noticeably different between the two passages is the fact that one says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, Ephesians 5. And then the other says, Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so some scholars, they concluded in God's mind, and I agree, be, being filled with the Spirit and letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly are parallel commands, right? They go sort of hand in hand. And this should not surprise us because we should know by now that the Word of God and the Spirit of God are essentially inseparable. They work together. We're not to create a wedge between the two, really. The Word is, what, the sword of the Spirit after all. And this means that one way to be filled with the Spirit is by letting the Word of God dwell in us richly. One of the more Memorable things, Pastor Andrew, not, not our pastor here, but Pastor Andrew from Philly, who visited us to speak at our spring revival meeting recently, uh, when it was, he was sharing a, a funny story. If you don't know the story, then just ask someone who was there. It was really, really a memorable, funny story. But he basically said, in order to experience revival, true revival, guess what? We need to read more Bible. Right? So revival means read Bible. I want to encourage some of you, I think the 12, or 12, I think it's about 12 or 15 of you who, who committed to reading through the Bible at least once this year. So keep on going. All right, let me encourage you to stay with it. Don't give up. It's worth it. Stay disciplined. Even if you're falling behind, stick with it. You know, for the rest of you, you, you can go at a slower pace for sure, but what I want to make clear is this. Not opening up your Bible at all throughout the week it cannot be an option for you. You must let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So I conclude with these words. Let's, let's obey the words given to us today. Let's not get drunk on alcohol. Let's not be influenced by anything other than the Holy Spirit. Let's be filled with him by letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Because only then, brothers and sisters, will you start walking with the Lord again while making the best use of the time. Remember, the days are evil. When we are filled, only then will we have any hope to grow in wisdom. When we are filled with the Spirit, only then will our relationships with our husbands, our wives, our parents, our children, our earthly authorities will become God-honoring. 
That, that is God's design for our life. Let's honor that design. Let me pray, pray for us as we conclude. Dear Father, we thank you for not only accomplishing salvation for us through your Son, but for applying that work of salvation in us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us to depend upon you each day far more than we depend upon the food we eat or the smartphones we use to get through the day. Forgive us for neglecting your word. May we desire for your word to dwell in us richly that we may truly be filled with your spirit and live not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. In Jesus' name we pray.